I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Back when I was in seminary, I preached my very first sermon in front of my class. The homiletics professor, who I think was born in the previous century, he, uh, he made a comment. The first comment he made was, uh, I was uh, obviously not from around there. Um, and then he quoted something in German. I said I, I didn't speak German, to which he frowned greatly. Um, but then he, somebody translated it for me, and it said, uh, in our church, this was in German, but in our church, we do not put on a show. That was, that was the, the saying. Um, I don't mean to put on a show. I know when I first came here 27 years ago, um, it seemed maybe different to a lot of you, the few of you that are still here, let's put it that way. But we like a show, don't we? We do. We do. We, we like a show. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, movies that, that don't entertain don't do well. TV shows that don't entertain are, are uh, canceled. We like a show. Jesus really put on a show. Now, he didn't go out of his way to do that. He didn't do it on purpose, you might say. But he did put on a show for a particular reason, so that people would listen to him. And that's what we get from our gospel reading today. That we should definitely listen to this Savior. We think on that as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Greetings to you this morning. Welcome to our service here at Trinity Lutheran Church. We're going to follow the order of service as it's printed for you in your worship folders this morning. And uh, we're going to begin with uh, the first hymn. Now, uh, I hope you read the Friday newsletter. In the Friday newsletter, I explained that uh, there are very, very, very few uh, Transfiguration hymns. This is Transfiguration Sunday. Um, in some hymnals, there's only one. In other hymnals, there's one or two, maybe. Um, there are more hymns, but they aren't used very often. And that becomes a, a, a problem, of course. Um, you know, if you have three hymns in your service on Sunday, what are you going to do? Uh, so uh, our hymnal, our new hymnal, or not relatively new anyway, has a, a number of Transfiguration hymns, um, most of which, unfor unfortunately, are unfamiliar to you. All right? So let's listen to the first one. Okay, listen to the melody. Okay, listen to the line uh, in there. And uh, uh, as those of you that can read music, okay, use the, uh, use the hymnal uh, and uh, help us all with this. So, Jesse, would you play the first hymn through once, please? I hope you can pick out that, that melody line. Now, of course, we'll play through again uh, just to introduce it as we always do with our hymns and then uh, go ahead and sing that uh, first verse. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the place and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Your lightnings lighten the world, O Lord. The earth trembled and shook. How beautiful are your dwellings, O Lord of hosts. Praise the Lord. Having obtained pardon for all our sins and thus peace with God, we now come before him in prayer and praise. O Lord God, the Father in heaven, you abound in grace and love, as the maker of all things continue to preserve them for our use. O Christ, our King, you bring salvation for all as God's own Son and our mediator, heavenly throne. Hear us and grant our supplications. O God, Lord God, the Holy Ghost, you create and guard our faith the gift we need the most. Bless our life's last hour that we leave this sinful world with gladness and peace. Please be seated. Let us give glory to our God. Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who in the glorious transfiguration of your only begotten Son 
confirm the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of the apostles, and who in the voice that came from the bright cloud did in a wonderful manner foreshadow our own adoption as sons, mercifully work to make us co-heirs with the King of glory and bring us to the enjoyment of heaven through Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Our Old Testament reading for this morning comes to us from the book of Exodus, chapter 3. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he held the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, and yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burnt up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And he said to him, Do not come near here, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me, and furthermore I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt." But Moses said to God, Who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And now they will say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This is the word of the Lord. A psalm portion comes from Psalm 2. But as for me, I have installed my king. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. Our epistle comes from St. Peter in his second letter to the churches, chapter 1. We did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy is ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This also is the Word of God. You are more fair than all the children of men. Grace is poured into your lips. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among all people. Hallelujah. We rise to hear the gospel of Christ. 
Our gospel today comes from Matthew chapter 17, beginning at the first verse. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came. They did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Here ends the Gospel. We confess the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Once again, I will ask Jesse to run through uh, a a verse uh, of the uh, next hymn so that you can hear it before we go ahead to sing. Go ahead, Jesse. Go ahead.
Grace, peace, mercy, and truth be multiplied unto you through Jesus Christ, your Lord, and uh, transfigured uh, Redeemer. Amen. Our concentration today will be on a particular verse of our gospel reading, verse 5. The last part of the verse says, And a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts now be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. In one way, it has been a short journey. It wasn't that long ago that we had the first Sunday in Epiphany, first Sunday after Epiphany. Just a couple of Sundays in the Epiphany season this year because the Resurrection Holy Week is fairly early. The Resurrection Day being the last day in the month of March. And yet at the same time, it's been a long journey. It's been a journey really of three years. More than three years. Maybe you could say 33 years really because when last we left Jesus, he was in the temple. He was in the temple on his eighth day, uh, or soon after the eighth day in any way, uh, being received there in the temple, and Mary and Joseph were paying the uh, sacrifice. And uh, we had the story of uh, Simeon and Anna. And then, of course, we had him at 12 years old, and uh, then uh, we had him soon after that at the first miracle. And so uh, we really covered a lot of territory in just a couple of Sundays. In that great journey, we saw Jesus do miraculous things. We saw him really uh, baffle, you might say, the scholars in the temple, even as a 12-year-old. And of course, we saw him demonstrate his great power over the forces of nature in his first miracle. But God was not here in Christ in order to show off. God was not in Christ in order to put on an entertainment display. He was not here so that people could go to a show, uh, gather together, and watch a kind of a circus. Jesus did these miracles for one reason and one reason only, so that people would listen to him, so that people would pay attention to him when he preached when he told his miracles, uh, parables, when he taught them in various ways. And of course, he did these miracles also to show that he was indeed the very Son of God, and that so when he died, his death could take away the sins of the whole world, as John the baptizer had said. My dear Christian friends, God does not show off very well, very often, in this world. Once in a while, he does in a spectacular way. And when he does, we can see it. Sometimes he shows off in our own lives. 
Sometimes we have miracles happen in our own lives or in the lives of those around us. We see medical miracles, people who are healed, uh, and the doctors have no reason, uh, no understanding why. Uh, we see people who should by all means be killed by a tornado or a hurricane or an earthquake, and yet they survive. We ourselves perhaps uh, miss uh, being in a deadly accident on the highway or something mere by mere uh, millimeters. So miracles happen too. But God, again, is not showing off just to show off. God's not doing that just to impress us. God is doing that so that we listen to him. And so we should listen to Jesus. We should listen to this person who is transfigured here on the mountain because of his person as the son of God, true God, true man in one person. And also we should listen to him because of his purpose. His purpose to redeem the world, to redeem you, to pay for your sins. This divine glory was just that. It was divine. His form was altered. We are told he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his garments even became as white as light. He was changed. You might call it kind of a uh, a complete energization of uh, Jesus that, that he, um, you might say, in a way, kind of uh, gave off uh, energy. He gave off light. Uh, he was not a reflection of light uh, anymore. He was actually light itself uh, giving off, glorified, transfigured in a great way. Think of maybe a a caterpillar uh, to a, buff, a butterfly, right? Uh, something we, we look at and we see it's very common, it looks like a worm. Uh, and then we see a butterfly, like a monarch butterfly or something like that. And of course, it's very, very beautiful. It's completely changed. doesn't look anything like the caterpillar it came from. Uh, this is a visible statement of Christ's godhood. You might ask yourself, well, if that's the case, then why didn't Jesus do this in front of, uh, oh, like 20,000 people, like he did with the feeding uh, uh, from, from the loaves and the fishes? Or, or why didn't Jesus do this at, on the top of the Mount of Olives uh, near Jerusalem? Or even really go to the temple? Why didn't he go to the temple and, and do this transfiguration on the steps of the temple itself? Or at least why didn't he take all 12 of the apostles or maybe even some of the 70 disciples too with him? Why just Peter, James, and John? Why this? God's own plan, again, wasn't to show off for the multitude wasn't to put on an, uh, uh, a circus, an inter entertainment uh, for the masses. That, that was not his purpose. He knew that Peter, James, and John then could testify to the twelve, and of course to the others, and to the world indeed, through like Peter's epistle where uh, we're told, in the second letter of Peter, we're told, you know, hey, I'm not following invented stories here. I, I'm not just following a myth or a tradition. I saw this with my own Two eyes. And so we have this divine glory and we have divine authority. We have the Father showing up and we have the Father displaying his pleasure with his Son. We have his Father basically saying, He has lived a perfect life. I am not just pleased, I am well pleased with him. He has done everything perfectly. Again, this is a declaration from God that he is now the perfect sacrifice. He does not have to die for his sins, folks. He can die for yours. He can cover your sins. He can pay, take your sins away. That's what his death means. More about that in a minute. God the Father appears in a form that is familiar to the Old Testament believers. That's what the apostles were still. They were Old Testament believers. They knew the Old Testament very well. And they knew that God appeared in cloud form very often. And God appeared in cloud and spoke from the cloud. And that's exactly what he did here. And so they would be familiar with this. They would know. They would hear uh, in their minds. Uh, they would hear the appearance of uh, uh, God to Moses in the burning bush, for example, or to the children of Israel in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. That's what they would think of when they saw the glory of Christ and they heard 
uh, God speaking from the cloud. The Father gives 100% approval to the work of Jesus and then commands us to listen to him. Listen in the words here. Listen means more than just hear. Listen means more than just know. Listen means more than understand even. Listen means here to follow. Do as Christ did. Follow also in the sense that we believe what he did and we believe it personally. We believe it to us. It does no good for someone to say, oh yeah, Jesus died for the sins of the world if you don't say that that included you. You have to have your sins in mind. And the devil, of course, is very good at bringing those sins up, isn't he? Oh, yes, he is. Oh, the devil is always there, ready to remind you what you did when you were eight, or 12, or 20, or 60. Right? He can always do that. And that's when it becomes very important that this story is here. It becomes very important for you to hear that God is well pleased with his son. It becomes very important for you to hear that he is going to suffer, and he's going to suffer for the sins of the world. And that includes you. And so when the devil comes to you and the devil whispers in your ear, hey, remember that lust in your heart? Hey, remember that hate for your neighbor? Hey, remember that lie you told? Hey, remember that cheating you did? Hey, remember that little thing you stole from the dime store? Hey, you remember all that? You can say, get behind me, Satan. Go away. Because Christ has paid for these things completely and totally. And so you have no hold on me. Get out of my face. Soon Jesus would be tortured, humiliated, and killed. And yet he would still be victorious. Why? Because, as he proves here, he is God. The transfiguration backs up his claim. Jesus proves here that he is to be taken seriously. A lot of this world does not take Jesus seriously. A lot of this world says, oh yeah, Jesus said some nice things. Jesus told some good stories. Jesus was a great guy. Jesus was a wonderful teacher, but that's it. That's as far as they go. Many people, the vast majority of people in this world, do not see Jesus as God. They do not see him as the Son of God, Savior of the world, Redeemer of all mankind. They do not see that. And that is to their great loss. You know, I'm sure you can think of times in your life when you would like to freeze time. Maybe a birth of one of your children. Maybe your wedding day. Maybe your new move when you moved into a new place. Or when you bought a new house. You would, or you were on vacation someplace and the day was just perfect. Everything went just right. Which is, of course, very rare, isn't it? <laughs> and those are the days you would like to just freeze. huh? Those are the days you would like to freeze. You would like to keep that forever. You would like to just, can I just stay here, God? Can I just stay right here? I don't want, I don't want, I want the clock to stop. You know, that stupid thing would just stop ticking. Oh, please, stop ticking just for once. Right? You have the feeling uh, once in a while? I think that's why Peter said what he did. Peter, he wasn't thinking straight when he said, hey, make me, hey, let's make a couple of houses for uh, you and Elijah and Moses. <laughs> right? <laughs> It's kind of silly. What, what do eternal people need with houses? Right? I mean, that's silly. But I think what Peter really wanted is, God, God, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's just stay. huh? Let's just stay on the mountain. Let's just stay right here and not do anything else. And of course, that, that couldn't be. That, that couldn't happen. Jesus had a purpose. And that purpose was to fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament. That purpose was to uh, continue to preach his gospel. His purpose was to go ahead and suffer, suffer the passion, uh, suffer the scourging, uh, suffer the crucifixion, suffer the death, suffer the burial in a borrowed tomb, uh, and then be risen from the dead. Now, the disciples looked and they saw, and notice something interesting here. They recognized Elijah and Moses. How did they do that? You know, it's not as though they had a snapshot. It's not as though they could pull up a, a picture on their phones. Oh, yeah, that's Elijah, that's Moses. How did they know Elijah and Moses? We don't know. The Bible does not say. But the Bible does say they recognized Elijah and Moses. Somehow, some ways. Also strange because the Jews uh, prohibited 
anyone making images of anybody. And so it's, it's not like somebody painted a portrait of Moses and Elijah and passed it down through generations. But again, they know they knew who these people were. And, and you know what that tells us? It tells us that Moses and Elijah are saved. You know, sometimes I wonder how the Romans get around this. The, Roman, the Romans we call Catholics. Uh, how do they get around this? Because they say uh, those people are in limbo. Those people, don't, those people uh, really aren't saved until the last day. They're really not in heaven at all. How, how do they get around that? That, that how they could appear here uh, in glorified form uh, along with Jesus, unless they were uh, citizens of heaven, we should say. And if the Old Testament believers, who did not know the name Jesus Christ, who did not know Jesus uh, of Nazareth, who did not know uh, of the particulars of the gospel that we do, if they are saved, then my friends, you also are therefore saved. Hmm? How much faith do you need to be saved? Do you need uh, the faith of uh, a pastor? Do you need the faith of a teacher? Do you, do you, do you need the faith of a, 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 a church official? Do you need the faith of an elder, a deacon? Do you need, no. You need to know that the Messiah was promised, the Messiah came, and the Messiah paid for your sins. There is life after death. This is comfort for believers. It gives them courage. Courage to face each day. Courage to put Satan away. Courage to live without sin as best as you can in this world with the help of the Holy Spirit. Courage to preach the gospel to those around you because you know that, thing, that life is eternal. Life is not temporal. Life does not end when you die. When you breathe your last breath and somebody speaks words over you here and puts you in the ground, be it in ashes or in a body, that's not the end. You know that now because we have Moses and Elijah who lived 1,500 years and more before Christ. Here they are, showing up in their bodies, recognized by the apostles. The transfiguration, we know, fired up the apostles. But it wasn't just a quick fix. We know that in a, not too long from now, they would deny Christ and run away. But then they would remember that transfiguration. Peter would use it as an impetus and as, as a reason for him going out and preaching the gospel in the world. So also we're ready now to walk that final journey with Jesus. Next Sunday starts pre-Lent. With the Sunday Septuagesima and Sexagesima and Quinquagesima, those days right before Ash Wednesday, those are days of preparation. Let's get our minds set. We're going to hear some terrible things done to Jesus. We're going to hear people betraying him. We're going to hear about people hating him. We're going to hear about people killing our lovely Savior, our wonderful Lord. And it's going to be sometimes hard for us to remember that it wasn't the Jews that put Jesus on the cross, folks. It was us. Every single one of us. That's what Lent is for, to remember that, so that we return to God in repentance every day. Not to torture us, not to make us feel guilty, but to turn us in repentance so that we can live a more righteous life. Why? Not to impress God, but to impress others so that other people will again. Like we listen to Jesus, they would hopefully listen to us. It is not a man alone who is making this last journey to Jerusalem. It is the God-man, Jesus Christ. Are you ready to follow Jesus to Calvary? Are you ready to follow Jesus to Golgotha? Are you ready to follow Jesus to the tomb of Joseph Arimathea? Are you ready to follow Jesus to the scourging and to the death? Are you ready to follow Jesus with every core of your being? Are you ready to follow Jesus through all of the difficulties to come? And to celebrate then at his resurrection from the dead. So let us begin the Lenten season. Let us begin it with a promise and a vow. That we will be here at the foot of the cross. We will be here at his word. We will be here at his table. 
We will be here remembering our baptism. We will be here to receive absolution. We will be here to feed our souls at every opportunity so that we can not only follow Jesus, but listen to Him. Amen. And now the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in true faith. Through Christ Jesus, your Lord. Amen. You may be seated for prayer. Omnipotent God, who is worthy to be held in awe by all people, we give you most humble and hearty thanks for the many blessings which without any merit or worthiness on our part you have bestowed upon us. We praise you especially that you have preserved your saving word and the holy sacraments in truth and purity. Continue to protect and extend your kingdom throughout the world. Give your church faithful pastors and grant success to their preaching. Open the door of faith to unbelievers everywhere, including all the children of Abraham. In mercy, remember the enemies of your church and grant unto them repentance unto eternal life. Be the protector and defender of your people at all times of tribulation and danger. Cause all those in your church to fight the good fight of faith and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow your grace upon all the nations of the earth, bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Grant your word to be proclaimed openly throughout our country so that truth and righteousness should grow among us. Defend us from all calamities by fire, water, plague, war, and famine. Prosper everyone in their calling and cause all useful arts to flourish. Be the protector of the widow and the orphan, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the distressed. As we are but pilgrims on this earth, help us by true faith and godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work which you have given us before the end comes when we can work no longer. When our last hour comes, receive us into your everlasting kingdom only, through the merits of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We continue the top of page 13. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord, our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God. Now do we praise you that you did send unto us your only begotten Son, and that in him, being found in fashion as a man, you did manifest the fullness of your glory. And therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and singing.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We have the clear text in the very words of Christ. Do this in remembrance of me. These are bidding and commanding words by which all who would be Christians are enjoyed to partake of this sacrament. Therefore, whoever would be a disciple of Christ and with whom he here speaks must also consider and observe this. But in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ and to please him. Congregation may now come forward. For the Lord's Supper. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given to you on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ sacrificed on the cross for your sins. This is the true blood of your Savior shed for you and for the remission of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up for you on the cross for the sins of all your sins. May God bless and keep you always and forgive you all of your sins in Jesus. Amen. Take and eat. This is the body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
given to you from the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, sacrificed for you on the cross for your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, sacrificed for you on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given for you on the cross for your sins. This is the blood of your Savior, shed for you on Calvary's cross for the remission of your sins. Take and eat, this is the true body of your Lord given for you, for your forgiveness. This is the true body of your Savior, sacrificed on the cross for your sins. This is his blood shed for your sins. And now may this, the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the one true and saving faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Depart in God's peace. Amen. Please join now in the Nunc Dimittis. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks unto you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that in your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Amen. 
Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Grant you his peace. Please join in the uh, closing hymn, which is one I believe you know quite well. Please be seated. A very good morning to everyone once again. Good to have you here. Uh, we do have fellowship after the service this morning. So please take an opportunity to be warm and dry over in the fellowship hall and get something to eat and drink and share with one another your faith. Um, also, Bible class continues on Tuesday, 10 o'clock in the morning as usual. And uh, this Saturday coming up, we do have our Bible basics, okay? And the catechism at 2 o'clock. That's the schedule. Thank you and good morning. <laughs>